Hello and welcome to Dialogue. I'm Yang Rui in Beijing. Respect and protection for human rights are principles of China's constitution, and the judicial system plays an essential role in that work. Today, we look at the progress China has made in terms of the coverage of legal remedies, organizational structure, equal protection, independent trials, and judicial supervision. We will consider what new challenges China is facing and what measures could be taken to further improve human rights protection. To discuss these issues and more, I'm very happy to be joined in the studio by Tao Jingzhou, managing partner of Deckard LLP China Practice, and Anna Tangen, author and columnist. Also, we shall speak by telephone with Zhang Wei from China University of Political Science and Law. But before we get started, let's take a look at this background report. The last line of defense in safeguarding social fairness and justice. This is how the white paper describes the judiciary. It notes that the allocation of judicial powers and responsibilities has been improved, as has the independence and impartiality of the judiciary. The white paper says Chinese judicial authorities have reformed many areas in order to guarantee legal protections supporting human rights. China has streamlined its system for admitting cases by moving away from case reviews towards direct registrations. The criminal procedure law has been revised, with new legal principles including exclusion of unlawful evidence. Protections for the rights and interests of private parties in administrative lawsuits have been strengthened under administrative procedure law. The country also enacted the first anti-domestic violence law in 2015. In 2015, prosecutors at all levels demanded the withdrawal of over 10,000 cases wrongly filed by investigators. They also acted on some 32,000 cases of illegal conduct. Including unlawfully obtaining evidence and other abuses. Meanwhile, the judicial accountability system has been improved, and judicial transparency has been promoted to ensure the public's right to know. The white paper also highlighted pilot programs to establish a national judicial assistance system, and the abolishment of the system of re-education through labor. It nonetheless said there is still much room for improvement for the rule of law in China. Welcome to our studio discussion here, gentlemen. Now, why do you think China issues this white paper about uh, protection of human rights, particularly progress in this area in the reform of judicial system? First, I think, uh, in that sense, China has received quite some, uh, you know, observation or uh, criticism uh, from the international community. Also, human rights become a very important issue for. Ordinary people in China, so that's why Chinese government should respond to such concerns of both you know, abroad and domestically、uh, to explain what we really have done in the past years to improve the protection of、uh, human rights. And do you think this is a practice of accountability in response to the major concerns of Chinese and the foreign alike? Well, I think people overplay the foreign part. If you if you look at the way that、uh, China has developed since its original paper in 1991, this is a time of great change in the world. And this idea of protecting the rights of individual citizens、uh, kind of came into the forefront. So gradually, since that period, you've seen a number of reforms. They're very、uh, long-lasting. They take a step-by-step -step approach, and this is another step in that、uh, that thing. It covers a large list of areas. Yes, indeed, it's a very long and impressive list about the positive measures that have been taken in recent decades to reform the judicial system. For a further、uh, insightful look about the、uh, what, what has been done, let me、uh, cross over to Professor Zhang Wei from China University of Political Science and Law for his comments. Hello, Professor Zhang. Hello, hello. Are you impressed by the release of this white paper at this moment? Yes, I think、uh, it's a very important. As we discussed before, it's a very important role, educational role, to play、uh, in this whole process to inform the pu general public what China Chinese government has to be、uh, has to do、uh, for the for the moment and for the future. And secondly, I think it's also a very good improve、uh, improvement, also、uh, in implementation of international、uh, human rights、uh, treaties、uh, obligation. I mean. Uh, by doing that, China is Chinese government is able to fulfill its、uh, legal obligation 
to observe and implement international human rights treaties. It's, it's been the case for years since the founding of the PRC, particularly, that the overseas observers uh, tend to be very critical about the negative side of a human rights record. But the Chinese authorities would always uh, talk about the progress we have made. Uh, these are, of course, the two sides of the same coin. But do you think this white paper that has been released by the State Council Information Office will be able to convince those skeptical overseas observers about the progress, quote unquote, by the Chinese authorities in this particular field? Mr. Zhang. Uh, I think why Chinese government is issuing uh, this white paper is not because of, uh, purely because of international criticism uh, on the Chinese human rights performance. I think it's uh, actually uh, China is taking an active role, active uh, step to actually overcome the problems uh, China is, is facing uh, in that reality. So uh, I would rather think it's, uh, it's a positive role to, to, to take, to inform the public, to inform the public what rights they have, so that they will also be able to participate in this process very uh, publicly and also to support their uh, judicial reform. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Zhang. Uh, my interpretation my about the comments by Dr. Zhang is that uh, this uh, white paper is uh, an important part of the education that should be used to promote public awareness about the importance of the human rights, particularly that in the judicial system. But how important is it for the judicial system to particularly protect human rights? You know, what we, we say that judicial system is the last protection available to the people. So it's the last resort. So without a, a solid, independent, impartial judicial system, it will be very hard to, to give people impression that justice has been made. Because you have to make sure that the people feel that justice has been made. That's why we say we should try to prevent any intervention from a government organization for the running of justice. So that's why we said we have to increase the quality of the judge. That's why we said we, said we have to check a balance of judges' power, etc. cetera. So uh, come back to your question as to you know, why you know, there are a lot of criticism. I think uh, that's the press, because good, good news is not a part of the press for in a, in a foreign country. You know, they only talk about the, you know, some uh, single case where they have a problem. So if here in this report you have a hundred thousand of very, you know, uh, convincing cases, of course we do not uh, talk about that, the press. The press will talk about the bad story only. Yeah, the media tend yeah. to be negative about right. uh, whatever social or economic <coughs> issues. Anna, what are the major issues involved uh, in the discussion about the judge's accountability? Okay, uh, before we get on to that, I just want to make it clear. This is like the, the bones have always been there. All the protections that we're talking about in terms of uh, human rights and the rule of law have always been on the books. What you see here is putting muscle and flesh on the bones of this particular thing to make it work. So, for instance, when they start talking about uh, judges, there have been a number of cases. One, uh, we talked earlier, all cases have to be registered, all right, instead of informally being filed and then who knows what happens to them. Second, when cases are decided, they have to be put into a registry. The judge has to sign off on it. No more can uh, other judges sign on to uh, cases where they were not in pre uh, presiding part of the hearings as part of that. So when you start adding these things up, it's a series of procedures and reporting that makes sure that it's very uh, clear, uh, everyone can see it, it's transparent, and it makes it very easy for things. All the uh, discussions about the case have to be recorded and noted and be available. Uh, all of the uh, deliberations uh, are also uh, open unless it involves something like a minor or a very sensitive case. So when you start seeing this, you, you're seeing China gradually march towards this. And I, it's really because of the growing middle class. When you have a much larger group of people who are enfranchised, they, they do not want to be at the mercy of sort of arbitrary or no justice. 
they have to feel that the society is protecting them in order to be uh, very much behind that society. So this is a very natural uh, type of thing. And I, it, yes, there is international scrutiny, but I, I think it's overplayed sometimes. Ching Zhu, do you think this is a pretty normal for the growing army of the middle class in the olive shaped society of China to be more demanding about transparency and oversight uh, uh, about the uh, improvement of the judicial system. Yeah, with the uh, ever increasing middle class, they have more awareness of their legal right. Because in the old days, people do not care that much what the law gives them as a right. Now, there's such a, a, a strong uh, increase of awareness. Of course, I said, if I have this right, I try to enforce my right against the government, or against any you know, uh, public security, uh, prosecutor, etc. The issue of transparency always grabs headlines for the overseas media, and increasingly the middle class in China would also show their particular concerns about whether things have been effectively carried out, whether uh, effective supervision could be conducted to make sure that uh, serious and the real genuine progress is being made. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's a when China was formed, it was an ideology that created it and held people together. Now, in this second transition, uh, especially since Deng, you're starting to see this idea of a group of a group of laws. The rule of law is holding it together. So th this is this is an inevitable process. It will continue as, especially as China continues to move more and more of its people into the middle class areas. So it, it's it's just to be expected. Uh, yet another important practice that has been <coughs> introduced by this white paper is the uh, improvement of what we call the people's assessment system in China. In the United States, you have the jury uh, yes. system, <laughs> but we have uh, the people's assessors. That was said to have been borrowed from the former Soviet Union, kind of. Uh, but do you think this makes a big difference? Uh, I mean, do you think eventually one day we're going to uh, turn to jury? for help instead of a people's assessors. I'm not a big fan of the jury system. I was part of the ABA and we studied it and we realized that people within two minutes of seeing all the parties to a case would make up their mind and then be looking for any kind of shred of argument or fact that supported their initial things. And a lot of it was based on bias. Oh, that guy looks like my ex-brother-in-law. I didn't like him. He's probably a bad guy. Racial discrimination could also it, occur. Racial discrimination, things like that. It, it, the like in the case of O.J. Simpson. <laughs> that wasn't racial discrimination. But I, I, I'm not certain, so certain about the assessor system. I mean, because they also have, the, it's not just findings and fact. And in the, US, in the West, we say the jury makes the findings of fact, the, the judge applies the law. In this particular case, at a very beginning level, you have these assessors who can do both. So it's not clear. It's, they, they seem to be just quasi-judicial uh, with almost all of the powers of a judge, except they're not at a higher level. So, different. But it, they use here a panel of judges, which is more akin to the, what the French do. Right. I'm not a really fan of the assessors, because you have to know that now we hold the judge accountable for the judgment. If I sit with the two assessors, if they vote uh, something which, uh, according to me, is not really that correct, should I sign off? Or should I you know, have a majority vote of the two assessors only? So accountability of the judge is maybe not really compatible with the assessor system. Mm -hmm. um, Anna, maybe this is a question for you to uh, take a second look. Um, how can we evaluate the community correction system? Do we have a, such a thing in China? <laughs> I've never heard of this. I'm sorry for forgiving for my ignorance. No, no. What, what they've done is they've borrowed a lot of things from the West in particular things. I mean, they, they have very speci specific things about conditions of jails, uh, rights of prisoners, all of these things, how they should be treated, the fact that there should be uh, a, a very real system to um, uh, not repatriate, well, how do you say, make, make them better into better people. Because it, they have colleges that they've set up to do this. They have in-prison programs. They have people who are now designated to counsel these people so that there's not this recidivism, this going back to crime that they're, they're, they're concerned about. So this is, I think, very new. I think in, in the past, uh, Chinese jails were fairly severe. 
you were expected to obey, and that was it. And then from that punishment, you would hopefully, uh, the idea was that you would never commit another crime. I think they realized that this is not the end of the story. A lot of these people have children, families. When they come out, they have the stigma of, of having been in the system. And the question is, how do you turn them into productive factors? Thank you very much. You are watching Dialogue with Mr. Tao Jingzhou and Mr. Anna Tang. And we're discussing what, is, what progress has been made in the reform of China's judicial system according to the latest white paper on this particular issue by the State Council Information Office of the Chinese government. We'll be back in a short while. Stay with us, please. Well, um, with the pervasive use of the social media, the government at different levels in China has been placed under severe scrutiny of the media and the big population of the uh, internet uh, users. For example, the tragic death of Lei Yang, uh, uh, who is said to have been killed allegedly by uh, local police uh, enforcement forces. And the investigation is still well underway. However, um, the Ministry of Public Security recently issued some regulations concerning the proper behavior of the police officers under the supervision of the cameras, in other words, under the supervision of the media. But some of the cops may find it very difficult to, they find it very difficult to, uh, to get the case down, to handle the case. What do you think of the alleged inaction and the reluctance of the law enforcement, law enforcement personnel under this new circumstance? Well, when you impose some restriction on police power, they always feel uncomfortable. So mm -hmm. I think, I think it's a good move for Ministry of Public Security to allow the people to shoot uh, the video in front of the uh, mm -hmm. police. I think uh, for the transparency purpose, it's a good improvement. I think it's uh, ready to make sure that police, whenever they perform their duties, they have to perform, you know, properly and legally. So in some cases, I'm afraid the cops would also exercise their right to ban people from using the cameras. And that uh, interpretation could be very subjective uh, uh, and could be abused, <coughs> right? Well, I think public security is saying that you, you shouldn't be doing that and that you don't have the right to go turn that off. Um, but I mean, th there have been a number of things about the rights of the accused. We were just talking about the rights of the prisoner, but the rights of accused have been vastly increased. From now on, when you're interrogated, it must be recorded both uh, audio and visually. Uh, no evidence that has been coerced. If they planted evidence or if they coerced a confession of you, that will not, that will be rejected, right? So there are uh, more and more uh, rights to those who are accused to make sure that you don't have this kind of miscarriage of justice. I think on, on one side, it's good to have the uh, social media uh, as an extra watchdog, but that can also be played by the press as well. So it's kind of balancing these things out. It, it'd be very tough to be a police officer with, you know, every time you, you, know, you think everyone's watching you with their camera, and that could be very intimidating. It could lead you to do less. And in that particular case, that would be a miscarriage uh, of justice because you do expect your police, sometimes they do go on hunches, sometimes they are, see somebody who's suspicious, and they, and they go and look at them. Uh, it doesn't mean that they're be doing bad, bad things, they're actually trying to protect society. But in any event, with uh, this, uh, you know, technology development, you know, for the improvement of transparency, it's much easier mm -hmm. now with the uh, video uh, recording, for, both for the, you know, pr uh, procedure, uh, interrogation, and also we talk about the, in the court system for the publication of uh, the judgment. So I think it's uh, very good. China has been upgrading juvenile justice, Anna, since the first tribunal for minors was established 32 years ago in an effort to provide better protection for young offenders and their victims. What is the focus of that work and what more can be done to prevent juvenile delinquency in the first place? Well, one, one area that was the thing is the abolition of uh, work. Uh, forced work uh, camps, and these, this was ver a very, very. You mean the system of re-education uh, through, through labor? Through labor, yes. Is that it, something we copied from the former Soviet Union, the Gulag? <laughs> uh, uh, well, I, I don't know if it was a Gulag, but it, it, some people uh, made it equivocal. The issue was it was not clear how the decisions were made. There was no process involved. 
what it would happen is the police or somebody would say, look, send them off to... Uh, Are to you suggesting clearly that the all things could be put into this basket uh, indiscriminately? That, was, that has been the allegation those Without following the process. It. Okay. Now, the, the issue was there wasn't a clearly delineated process to do this. It's not that re-education through work is itself a bad thing. For, in some cases, it might be a good thing for certain individuals, but there was no process. And in some cases, there are allegations that the process was used simply as reprisals uh, for economic or political gain. Yeah. So th th you, you, you definitely don't want that. But now they've moved to a system where they say that the rights of people under 18 will be protected if the sentence is less than five years, it, it can be expunged, uh, that they will be treated differently from an adult that they will have uh, extra uh, opportunities to get back in line so they can become productive uh, members of society. So you, you see this kind of very liberal leaning uh, idea of readjusting how you're thinking about people who've committed crimes, not just punishing them, but trying to figure out how they can again become productive members of society, which is very much of the 70s and 80s thinking in the West. Yeah. Talking about the re-education by labor, this was abolished the, you know, three years ago. The reason that they have received so many criticism is because they deprive your right without a legal procedure. It's a decision purely by police, not a subject to judicial review. That's why it's uh, against, uh, I would say, the, the law. But what was the uh, original driving force for the establishment of such a system of uh, re-education through uh, labor? Uh, I mean, was it about efficiency and effectiveness uh, on the primary stage of China's uh, rule of law, if it could be called rule of law? Look, you know, at the end of the day, you can have all of the systems you want, but without good people, you're going to always have a miscarriage of justice. Yeah, right? yeah. Also, this, that system was established in 1957. At that time, it's a, after revolution, so it's more revolutionary measures versus rule of law measures. The controversy over the death penalty has been around for quite a long time. Uh, the Supreme People's Court agrees to review uh, the death penalty. This is indeed a, a big step in the correct direction, but is it enough? Of course, the abolition of the death penalty is a must for those who apply for membership of the European Union. Uh, the United States maintains and retains the death penalty in some of the states. In China, we become very careful we start to become very careful about the execution, uh, I mean, I mean the, the, the death penalty. What do you think? Yes, um, death penalty is not abolished in China, but they must be used with extreme caution. That's why all the death penalty sentence must be approved by Supreme Court. Uh, you had some cases where, you know, because of the abuse of a, a policeman, there are some people were wrongfully you know, sentenced to death. That's why with such an uh, error in the past, they try to be even more careful. But I uh, think that uh, China is ready to abolish the death penalty, like uh, in most of the European countries. Do you, do you stand for the abolition of the capital punishment uh, totally? No, I'm, I'm not against capital punishment, but I am against uh, wrongful pe people being wrongfully put mm. to death for crimes they did not commit. There has to be some way of, of verifying it. I think China is, is trying to find the right balance uh, mm. between that. Um, I, I just don't know that if somebody is never going to return to society, locking them up in a box until they die, uh, that would be my definition of cruel and unusual punishment. If there is no hope, there's no point. If you're putting a tremendous amount of resources to keep this person behind bars for no particular gain. And I, I don't understand it. So I think the more humane thing is to say, look, you are beyond the pale. We have found you know, your, your criminality or the acts that you've done as to be so far that you can never re-enter society and we're, we are making a decision to end your life. And put those resources to somewhere productive. When we look at the issue of the death penalty, a lot in China were shocked when they learned that the guy who killed over 70 people in Norway a few years ago was put behind the bars and he could enjoy you know, the benefits of a gymnasium and he could enjoy the assistance of a coach in the gymnasium. I mean, he, the, the window of his jail could not have any bars that, because the bars were, would be used in other cases and in other, and other circumstances to give him the impression that he has lost his freedom. That should not 
be allowed to happen in Norway, a country that respects unconditionally human rights. But what do you think of the uneasiness of the Chinese? I mean, uh, ma many other people in developed countries would also disagree with such a, a degree of, uh, you know, uh, respect for human rights. So, someone who killed over 70 people with uh, automatic rifles. Mm -hmm. well, I, uh, Brevik was uh, beyond the pale. I would have put him to death. Uh, yeah. No question asked. I mean, I, I just don't see any... Is that a cultural difference? Uh, do, do you think we have cultural diversity no, no, in I, our I, interpretation no, of human no, rights? I'm not Norway should have done it. I'm mm. saying that if I was in, in the decision making... I, he, I would, he, was Jack. he would If I that. was a judge. But I'm saying that there are uh, diversities of opinions. We're entering a multipolar world and the legal systems are going to follow the cultural uh, systems. And it's not going to be always something that I agree or disagree with. The issue is, do, do those people in that country agree or disagree with? But the, the problem is, even though you sentence him to death penalty, those 70 people are not going to come back. Well, so fundamentally, that's, that's the case. trying to be you know, more human than all these criminals. Maybe that's the, the philosophy pursued by countries such as Norway. I'm more, Why surprised, is it I'm more surprised that the families of the victims in yeah. Norway we're ready to forgive that guy uh, and we'll do accept this uh, practice by the authorities in that country. But the last question is very much how China should respond to overseas criticism about a human rights record. I think Hillary Clinton, if uh, she was to, uh, you know, to be the master of the White House, she would be very demanding about the human rights. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I so. think the first thing is continue to publish all the statistics showing the progress that China has made and uh, try to be more transparent uh, for all procedure uh, uh, of the legal procedure, both uh, at the, the police level and at the tribunal level. Uh, then have a, a, a program such as this one to talk about <laughs> the possible <laughs> progress of a change of human rights. Thank you very much. The issue of transparency is indeed a crucial word in our vocabulary about any serious improvement of the human rights in China, particularly in the judicial system. I'll see you next time. Until then, goodbye.